Hey, 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 hello, algorithms and soulmates. I'm Al Reynolds, and this is my new show on my YouTube channel, The Court of Public Opinion, the place where you, the people, will have a voice, can, and will be heard. Now, if you're new to the courtroom, make sure you grab a seat and maybe a pencil and pad, but please don't forget to hit that like button. If you're not subscribed to the channel, be sure to hit that subscribe and share button. And also, please leave a comment because we love the engagement. Now, listen, if you are a newbie to the channel, don't be alarmed. Think of the court of public opinion as Nancy Grace meets Rapid Fire meets Fox Soul's Face Off. Yep, you heard me correct. This courtroom may be disruptive. It may be messy. It may be informative. It may also, we might be hollering. We might be screaming. We might be talking over each other. We may be interrupting and laughing, but I promise you this, you're going to learn something in this court of public opinion. Be sure to buckle up. I'm your host and judge, Al Reynolds, and I have two legal beagles joining me today. A new legal beagle, everybody. Please put coffee cups in the emojis in the chat for attorney Kyra Coffee. Kyra hey, Coffee. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Welcome, Kyra. Kyra hey. is new. Kyra is an in house counsel and she does a lot of transaction law. All right, let's put those red wine emojis in that chat. The lovely Simone Redwine will be joining us tonight with Kyra Coffee as we talk about some very interesting topics. Let's see those uh, red wine emojis. And don't forget, for me, don't forget our facts. That's F-A-X, facts emojis, so that we know that you're ready for all of this that we're legal tea that we're about to drop. So first up, we're going to talk about a 70-year-old transgender attorney is turning heads in Washington State courtrooms, <laughs> highlighting not her legal expertise, but her significantly enhanced breasts. Is this okay, Legal Beagles? Is this even legal for attorneys to represent themselves as such? We're going to get to the bottom of it today. Second up, we're going to talk about Nigel Lithgow. You know, the British television director and film producer for the fame shows, You Think You Can Dance and American Idol. Paul Abdul tried to tell us about his sexual uh, uh, sexual assault allegations, but were we listening when she tried? Up three, Ray J and Princess, they're back at it again with their fourth divorce <laughs> filing announcement. And this time, Ray J wants joint custody and all of their assets separated. We're going to talk to our legal beagles why that's important that he asked the courts for those two things. Next up, we have Tom Brady, and he's in hot water again, and it's not for the deliberate deflation of footballs, but maybe the deliberate deflation of FTX cryptocurrency. We know that him and his ex-wife Giselle had lost over $30 million dollars but he was an ambassador and people are suing him because they believed what he was saying about FTX. Then we're going to talk about Danny Madison. Do you guys remember Danny Madison from that 70s show? Well, guess what? He's been sentenced to 30 years to life in prison for raping two women. Lastly, we're going to talk about parents of the Chicago school shooter each get 10 to 15 years in prison for what their kid did. Is that legal, my legal beagles? Is that too expensive or is it just right? All right, uh, soulmates and, and, and algorithms, let's get started with today's topics. And first up, we're going to talk about this transgender who's actually 70 years old, who's been practicing law for 20 years in the state of Washington. Now, what we also know about this 70-year-old attorney is that she has enhanced breasts and that she used to have a crowdfunding page titled Stephanie Public Defense Fund that was raising money for her to get a car. All right, attorney Simone Redwine. Now we know you are one sexy attorney and no sexist talk from the judge here, but I'm just calling a spade a spade. Do you think it's okay for a public defendant to dress like this in the courtrooms of Seattle, even after she's been mandated to wear respectful business or office attire while practicing law in their courtrooms? Hell no. It <laughs> aggravates me so much when I see attorneys try and give uh, people who they represent as public offenders, uh, 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 
as a public defender, right? People who are not paying, who are too poor to pay, they give them a lower level of service than they give a paying customer. That's not right. You are not supposed to do that. And that is against the oath. She knows good and well. If she walked into anybody's consultation like that, everybody would gather their belongings and walk out. Some people might scream and others might cry. I know. <laughs> she knows. And furthermore, I want to be very clear. This is not about her being transgender. This is about her having her titties and her nipples out. It's <laughs> okay to be a sexy and an attractive attorney, but there is a time and place for everything. I will dress one way. I'll dress this way if I'm going to happy hour. And I dress a different way if I'm going to court. Because at the end of the day, as a public defender, you are in front of jury members. And if that's your lawyer, I'm convinced you did it. Mm. <laughs> Attorney Coffee, let me know. Yeah. Let me ask you this question right here. Um, is it legal for the city of Seattle to mandate that she wear business attire? Yes, there is a certain decorum and repertoire that you're supposed to come when you present yourself to the court. And like um, Attorney Redwine mentioned, you have an oath to defend your client. And it is very distracting when you come to court looking a hot mess. Like if you have a jury or even as a judge, I'm distracted and probably having a hard time paying attention to the facts of what the attorney is saying based on what they're dressed. So you're doing your client a disservice by coming to court looking like a clown. I'm sorry. That's my opinion. Yes. And like that is, that is <laughs> very disruptive and distracting to the whole court proceeding. So she is, I think, doing her clients a disservice and making a mockery of the court, which judges do not stand for. So I mm. would not be surprised if she's held in contempt and probably fined the next time she comes looking like a circus. And now, let me ask you this. Okay, go ahead, Simone. I would say for anyone, if this was your court appointed lawyer, you have every right to file a complaint. Right. You have every right to file a complaint, right? Because literally, you're going to lose credibility. People are going to think if this is the lawyer you hired, they're not going to know they're court appointed, that if this is who you hired, you don't have good sense. But also, I know many judges who would throw out defendants dressed like that. So Got if you it. can be a defendant dressed that way, hell no, not a, not a lawyer. So let me ask you this. This is something that I think we could use as a learning moment, because I heard you say something that made my ears perk up. And for those uh, algorithms out there, those viewers that are watching this. So when you are assigned, because a lot of us can't afford attorneys, right? A lot of, of the public cannot afford attorneys. So when you are there you and they say, do you want an attorney assigned to you? When you get that public defendant, do I have the right? to ask for a different one? Is that what I'm hearing? Or do I have to have a reason? Like the reason why I don't want this one is because I feel like they dress like that. It may hurt my case. Can I ask for a different public defendant that's assigned to me? Or do I have to stick to the one that the state assigned to me? You, you can ask if you have cause and baby, this is cause. Yes. This is good cause. Got so it. what you should do is you should ask in court with the court reporter sitting there next to the judge, you should say, judge, is it on the record? I would like to go on the record and ask for a different attorney. I am concerned that this attorney's attire is going to impact my case and my credibility with the court, uh, with the with the jury. And then Got the it. judge on the record has to give you a yes or no. And if you're ultimately found guilty, that could be grounds for appeal. Attorney Adding to that, if along with those lines, if this judge has, I mean, this attorney has already been sanctioned and mandated by the court, by the state bar to dress a certain way, then I would say I'm questioning if they're here to properly represent me or if they're here for their own antics and tactics, because the priority should be the client. And if you come looking like that, and you've already been told not to do that. Then is your real agenda pushing whatever personally you want to push or to really mm. advocate on behalf of your client? And Got I would it. say that it's definitely not the interest of the client doing some nonsense like that. All right. Speaking of the interest of the client, we're going to move along to Nigel Lethgo, who is the executive producer of two of our favorite mm -hmm. uh, competition shows. So you think you can dance an American Idol. Now, this is an interesting case because after 16 seasons, they've decided to boot his butt off of the panel because he's going through legal issues. Now, what I find so interesting, Attorney Coffee and Attorney Redwine, is that when Paula Abdul was on that American Idol panel with him, no one actually believed her. In fact, they released her because they felt like that she was too much of a problem. Fast forward 12, 13 seasons later, now everything that Paula Abdul is saying is right. Absolutely. What say you, Attorney Redwine? 
Absolutely. Now we have to remember, Paula Ad Abdul did have some additional issues. Part of her other issues is she was struggling with substance addiction. She had an addiction to, I believe it was opioids. She was coming to set, slurring her words on camera, et cetera. So it was, it was multiple things she was facing. Mm. But also an interesting factor is that when Paula filed her lawsuit, she filed it under her name. At this point, I wonder if perhaps she should have filed her lawsuit under Jane Doe. Ooh. subsequent victims did. Mm, that's right. Because when you file it as Jane Doe, it allows the media to pick up and focus on the facts, not the person. And it can also reduce the likelihood you'd be retaliated against in the way that she may have been. Kyra, mm -hmm. I mean, Attorney Kyra Coffey, tell me, is it an option? If I'm not familiar with the law and I go sit with a lawyer, can I tell the lawyer, hey, for protection of my identity, I don't want to use my name. I want to use Jane Doe because I'm thinking about it. One of the things that happened when uh, me and my ex were filing for our divorce, we did anonymous versus anonymous because we didn't want it to be exposed to the media because people work in these courthouses. And when they see these documents, they actually get paid by outlets like TMZ to leak certain information. So yes. is it an option for those who are not of the celebrity level to actually say, hey, attorney, I want to go under Jane Doe? Yes, absolutely. You can have various reasons as to why that's important. Even if you're not a celebrity, if you're a minority woman and you feel like that will hinder the, the jury's um, perspective of the facts of the matter, then you can definitely make a pleading for the for you, for your identity to be a Jane or a John Doe, especially in situations like this where it's a gender violence, which is different from domestic violence a little bit, where it's focusing on the fact that the offense or the crime occurs simply because the person was a woman. And ah. so if you look at someone like Paula Abdul, who is a minority woman, let's be real. Like, you know, they're not really going, oh, okay, yeah, who cares? You know, but where right. is it someone maybe of a non-minority, you know, Caucasian woman, then you have a little bit more credibility. So I say all that to say, like, it definitely does have its pros and cons as to why someone does want to um, plead anonymous or be their um, identity be um, anonymous in a pleading. And it, it, but it is a pro and con. You have to look at both sides of the coin because when someone's identity is hidden or held anonymous, the public sometimes feels like. Well, I why see. are they being secretive? And we may judge and think that they're not telling the truth because they're hiding their identity, where really they're wanting you to look at the facts and not the individual before making, you know, um, before making your decisions on. Now, you know, this is the yeah. court of public opinion right here. And we will, we will judge you. <laughs> we will judge you accordingly yeah. on the court of public opinion. All right, yeah. Simone Redwine, before we move on from this, talk to me a little bit, though, because now he's facing a new lawsuit as of March, accusing him of a sexual assault battery with gender violence. So right. what are they saying? And you know what I find so interesting about this? Once again, I hate, hate, like, I hate to keep bringing this up, but I will. You know, when Paul Abdul was, was bringing this forward, he was at the time, you know, he's dated names like uh, Priscilla Presley. He's dated Raquel Grouch. So he was like Hollywood royalty. So she was going up against a lot mm -hmm. of odds and they didn't believe her. And now even a new lawsuit is being filed against him, which make will make the fourth woman to come forward. Now they're finally listening. And why are they, what made them listen so closely on this one as it relates to gender violence? Now, gender violence. Now, I actually filed a lawsuit against R. Kelly under the same type of statute. It was the New York version of the statute. And the reason that I selected is for gender-based violence. It's basically a, a crime against a woman like S assault, where they would have only done it to women. It's something they would have done mm. against a woman. And therefore, what the law has enacted, and these are fairly new laws. These laws came in response to the Me Too movement. What those mm. laws state is that if you file under those provisions, and if you're successful, in addition to the other damages you can receive, you can receive your attorney's fees and up to trouble damages. Wow. That's significant because generally attorneys like myself who take on those cases, similar to the attorney that took on Cassie's case, we take those cases on contingency fee. We usually charge 33 and a third if we resolve it without filing suit. And then we bump it up to 40% if we have to litigate the lawsuit. So what that means is that 40% that you would have lost that would have been our fee if we win under gender-based motivation crimes 
you don't have to lose that third that Ooh, 40. Oh, this is some good tea right here. <laughs> this is really good tea. Oh, this is amazing. Now, is it also true, depending on if it's a racial discrimination, that that could also happen? I, I think I've heard. <laughs> If it's employment based, yes, uh, it's employment based. You know, be. Every state's a little different. Right. So I, I happen to have participated in the largest racial discrimination case against African American bankers in the history of civil rights, and we won. And one of the things that we were most concerned about was the lawyer fees, because it took eight years for us to get this settled. Yeah. And we actually found out that because of because it was an employee race based, like you stated that our attorney fee, our attorneys did not have to take a chunk out of the settlement. This is some good information. And just repeat one more time, because I want all of the ladies and men, because gender doesn't mean just ladies, right? In this right. case, can Correct. you explain to us one more time how that works? So the gist of it is if this is an offense that this person committed against you based on your gender, so it could be same sex or opposite sex. So in the Little Rod case, I believe some of his wording is so that he could implicate that provision um, under the law. Or it could also be if a boss or if a coworker or if a man uses his sexuality to basically forcibly S assault you or in any way attack you, then you can move under that particular state's gender based crimes act because he wouldn't have done it against you mm. but for your gender excellent all right let's keep moving ladies and gentlemen all right ray j and princess are back in the news for the fourth filing of their divorce all right this time ray j wants joint custody and he's made it very clear that he wants all assets separated attorney red wine why is he making it a point a well, I have a couple of questions here. A, why is he making it a point that all assets be separated? That's number one. And number two, do the courts get upset when you run in and out of them, wasting their time with these pseudo divorce and then taking them back and then, oh, no, I'm going to divorce you again and taking them back? Is there a rule to how many times you can exercise or play with the court like this? So there's no, I'll, I'll answer the second question first. There's no rule against it, but you do, you wait long enough. You have to file a brand new filing fee. You have to pay new retainers to your lawyer. So it's not cheap. Um, and you may or may not get the same judge. So it varies. If you have the same judge, sometimes that's easier depending upon how far along that you've been before, but there's no rule against it because in the end, the court gets paid every time. Oh, yeah. OK. And, and, and talk to me about why is he making it known that he wants all assets separated? Because here the streets are saying Miss Princess is doing her thing. She's winning poker, poker mm -hmm. tournaments to the tune of a couple of millions. And she's considered one of the top poker players in the country, meaning she could be, uh, you know, expected to make multiple millions. She what are sure your thoughts is. on why so would he want think. I think the reason he wants those assets separated is because remember, he just started this new company mm. and right now the new company ain't making any money. I think he wants to separate it out so that new company can be his mm -hmm. and only his. Then princess gets her, will get her, you know, poker money. But as long as that corporation is his, he's going to keep it. As long as they're in the middle of a divorce, he's going to keep the earnings low. He's probably going to keep them in debt. And then boom, soon as that divorce is final, <laughs> He's going to ensure they have assets, they have deals, they have endorsements. So I believe it is to minimize the percentage that the two of them would argue over or that he would have to give her of his new company. You know, I also was thinking, too, because we interviewed him on TGIF and he was talking about all of these new shows that he had in the on the docket that have been greenlit, some greenlit for Zeus, some greenlit for his platform, some greenlit for other platforms. He had like 10 shows, Simone, uh, attorney uh, Red Wine and attorney Coffee, that's mm -hmm. coming out. They're all fighting women, fighting men, fighting transgenders, fighting. It's all fighting, of course. But it looks like it's getting a lot of press. Do you think maybe he wants it separated because he knows that he's about to hit the cash cow with these shows the same way that that the CEO of Zeus hit the cash cow? I would say I would say absolutely. It makes me think of Derek Jackson. Remember the guy? He was the relationship guru yes. who found cheating with everybody. OK, well, in the middle of the divorce situation, he was given a TV option from BET. 
And he specifically, to my understanding and what I was informed is that he specifically told BET, hold on to that contract. I don't want to sign it till after my divorce is finalized, because if I sign it now, I'm going to have to give up half. Same thing mm. with the court. So in the, in California, because of the fact that their divorces can take a long time, you can ask for the court to separate your assets in the middle of a divorce. And then that way you could spend the rest of the time arguing about other logistics like equity in the home or children's visitation, whatever, uh, whatever. But once those assets are split, you basically can go on with your way. Kim Kardashian did the same thing when she was sick and tired of going round and round with Kanye's. <laughs> oh, that sounds smart, too. All right. All right, uh, mm -hmm. Attorney Coffee, we're going to go into a little bit of transaction law, in-house mm -hmm. counsel. I'm going to need your, uh, your understanding as it relates to Tom Brady. Now, Tom Brady, he's in hot water because he served as an ambassador for the cryptocurrency platform FTX. FTX has since filed for bankruptcy and left thousands of clients out of billions of dollars. Now, a lot of those clients are now suing uh, Tom Brady for misleading them. Can you talk to me, Attorney Coffee, on the importance and also why people should not necessarily serve as ambassadors or endorse platforms like this because it could lead them in the courthouse in a legal situation that they weren't necessarily signed up for. Yes. So there has to be some accountability, especially in the day of influencing. Like you cannot just say, oh, this is a great product because they're paying you. And when in fact, it's a terrible product because people are relying on what you're saying and going out and purchasing the products or doing whatever, um, in this case, uh, with the stocks and cryptocurrency. So Tom Brady is being held liable for false advertising because as a celebrity or any endorser who is being paid and compensated for what you're saying, your statements have to be based on your opinions, your experience with the products, or even your beliefs of what it is and what it cannot do. And if you're saying that a product or a service is going to produce or perform a certain way, then you have to do your research and make sure that there is some type of scientific backing that that product or that stock or that service is is in fact going to perform in the way that you're saying. So in Tom Brady's case, as well as several other celebrities who asserted that FTX was to perform and turn out all these billions of dollars when in fact it was doo-doo, then <laughs> hey, you're so liable for that because people went out and invested in this based on you being Tom Brady, you asserting that, hey, this is so great, when in fact you knew or should have known that it was not. And if you did not know because you did not do your own homework, but you endorsed it, then shame on you. And you're still held responsible for that. Oh, okay. Before we get to that, because I got some questions here. I want to thank Kiki Couture. I got my first super chat. I got my first super chat. got my first super chat. Okay. Order in the court. Order in the court. Order in the court. <laughs> All right. So this is a question. And one other thing I wanted to add. Can I add okay. real quick to the FTC? Um, sure. I also read that uh, FTC is bankrupt. And that's the whole issue, FTX, right? FTX. FTX. FTX is bankrupt, which means the, the shareholders and so forth, they're likely not getting anything from FTX, the entity. So right. I think that's in part why they're lining up all of these celebs and suing them for basically false advertising due to the fact that um, they actually would be liable and they could recover money from them. As Absolutely. well as all of those celebs, they have insurance policies that are supposed to protect them from situations like this as well as something called indemnification agreements, where mm -hmm. basically I'm sure Tom Brady's lawyer went uh, in the contract, said, hey, if for some reason I endorse this and I get sued, I'm going to pay out the whatever I owe, but then your insurance company has to reimburse me. So line them up, y'all. If you need that money, line them up, sue all the celebs. They're probably getting indemnified by a big old insurance company. Oh, cool. Even mm -hmm. though... FTX is bankrupt and they were the ones that would hold the insurance policy when the bankruptcy solve, I mean, put that insolvent. No, that's the beauty of the insurance. Think of it this way. If you hit someone with your car, it was your fault and you file bankruptcy. Does your car insurance still cover it? It sure does because you right. paid up your policy. So as but, long as the insurance okay. was in effect, 
As yes. long as it's yeah, as long as it's in effect, because I was thinking in this case it may not be. In. Okay, so this is my next question as it relates to that. So then, is this what happened with DJ Envy? Because DJ Envy clearly was an ambassador for that scamming real estate man in in New Jersey, and we know that uh, D, uh, DJ Envy's name ended up on many lawsuits and complaints, saying that that he actively you know, recruited for this scammer. Can you talk, any of you, Coffee? Uh, I, uh, think, I think that DJ Ivy's involvement was a little bit more hands-on than just being an endorser. Because with this, with the FTX, they own the company and Tom Brady doesn't have any ownership or he doesn't receive any profit or anything from the how well or how bad the company does. They have a set price as to what his endorsements are. Mm -hmm. Whereas with DJ Envy, if I remember correctly, he was actually involved to some degree. Um, like with, having seminars um, and conferences. Right, right, yeah, right. He was definitely more hands-on. So why haven't we heard today. anything about this? How is he still able to still be on The Breakfast Club with such a looming number, not just one or two or three, but numbers of lawsuits over his head for fraud? But I think because they're all civil, none of those are criminal, right? So he's not been indicted. He's not been accused of a crime at this point. Um, and I, I think we all know uh, DJ Envy is going to roll. He's going to roll over and over and over. He's going to tell it on anybody needs to be told so that Got he it. can stay free with his family. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. I love the concept because I've always wondered how does that happen? And in my opinion, because of that negative media, you know, we talked about moral clauses. I was always wondering why iHeart never exercised his moral clause, because that was definitely a big hit that they were taking with all that negative, you know, attention around him being on iHeart. So what do you think, uh, Attorney Redwine, why do you think they didn't uh, exercise an out on his moral clause? I think the moral clause, usually the moral clause is something more attenuated to conduct that you have been found responsible responsible mm -hmm. for or that there's strong evidence, right? So I think if he gets indicted, if he gets charged criminally, then absolutely they're going to use that. Got um, it. All, and also we have to remember his co-conspirator, uh, the partner, Caesar, Caesar is a felon and he went to prison for scamming and I believe drugs right. as well. So that's why the feds pounced on him first. Mm-hmm. And a company doesn't want to jump the gun and release DJ Envy or anything and then it be found that the charges either be dropped or that there's not enough evidence against him. And then DJ Envy then have a case against iHeart yes, or you know that platform for an inappropriately letting him go. Okay, so got it. All right. You want to be mindful of, of letting someone go for charges that have not been found guilty yet. Got if it. If it's not okay. too egregious. All right, coffee. I see you. I see you, attorney coffee. Just, just teaching us all types of stuff. All right, guys, put some of those coffee cup emojis in that <laughs> chat to let us know that we're appreciating the incredible Kyra coffee tonight, leaning in on all the good dialogue and the law. As we talk about the law, let's go to Danny Matterson. You know, the guy from that 70s show that we all love. He has been sentenced now to 30 years to life in prison for raping two women. Now, it was forcible rape, and two of the women were 23-year-olds, and one of them was 28, all under the age of 30. What say you, Attorney Redwine? I'm so disgusted. I think the time is appropriate. Uh, if you look at Darren Sharper, who was also a major celebrity, he got quite a bit of time. I believe he got something in the 20s. And this um, 30 years to life, what that generally means in California is he has to serve approximately 30 before he can be eligible for parole. And you have to remember, he also wrapped up a bunch of his little celebrity friends like Ashton Kutcher and his wife, um, Mila, or whatever her name is, uh, because they wrote letters of, of support. Of support. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Back to I think that. because it was three separate women, it seemed like a modus operandi, like this is how he does it. The evidence was too strong. If that's the crime, I don't care if you're a celebrity. 30 years, take it out of here. Go on. Now, you know what's so interesting to me, though, is did we see a lot of this in the media? That's the question I that I have. Yeah, legally, really legally, I think he just kind of scooted right on past and underneath the Diddy stuff. And we don't really know this man 
was actually found guilty of forcible rape. You know, Diddy is all accusations and he's being hung in the court of public opinion. This guy who's actually done it is going to prison. And I, I haven't seen much coverage. Have you seen much coverage? Nope. No, and that, that kind of actually goes to some of the statements that have been made by attorneys, by people in, um, in favor of Diddy, that is this really just a media grab? Um, what is the truth to it? We're making judgments before full brought against him. Um, and even the judge condemns the attorney for the individual, I can't think of his name, um, who filed the case. He was just like, this is frivolous. Like you're, the charges aren't even correct in the civil suit. You have released things to the media that you shouldn't have. So it's really just kind of pointing out what is the agenda of these, some of the individuals, I'm not saying all, um, mm -hmm. but what is some of the agenda behind some of the individuals that have filed claims against Diddy? And also are they, even in their own interest, are they going about it the right way? Because they are in, in fact, I think putting their own justice in, je in jeopardy. All right. Before we go to our last story of the evening. All right, algorithms, I need you to hit that like button, please. I think we got a whole lot of people in our chat, but we have very little likes. Please hit that <laughs> like button. Right now, please hit that like button. Please put some red wine emojis, some coffee emojis, as well as some fax emojis in the chat if you're learning anything tonight. And as we rotate to our final story, um, we've had this conversation before, and I'm finally I'm glad to see that certain states have decided to institute this particular law, and that is the parents, the parents of that Michigan school shooter. Each get both parents are getting 10 to 15 years in prison. I've said for a long time that the only way we're going to auto correct with these young kids, how they're misbehaving, they're beating up teachers, they're going into schools, shooting people, they're taking guns to school, they're robbing 7 Elevens, they're raiding the McDonald's, they're doing all these ridiculous stuff. They're stealing cars, they're crashing people's property, they're stealing people's money, is to make the parents accountable. Attorney Redwine, is this decision to send these parents to prison 10 to 15 years because of what their son did, is this appropriate sentencing? Absolutely. And here's why. Because unlike the other school shooting cases that I've seen, in this one, the parents were specifically made aware. The school had made them aware and complained about the son's behavior. Specifically, one day at school, prior to this, he was drawing a, a weapon. He was drawing a gun. It scared the teacher so badly, she called the principal. They had a meeting with the parents. The parents bought him a gun for his 15th birthday, despite him saying he was suicidal, despite him saying that people were bullying him and he had no friends at school, et cetera. And in fact, the day before this shooting, this shooting, they called the parents into the front office and there was a meeting between his mother, the principal and the young man about him uh, making threats, drawing guns, all of these different things. And the mother never took the gun away from the child. Not mm. only did she not take the gun, she didn't even search his backpack, not that day or the following day. And so for that reason, that's what the court pled to, uh, spoke to. And then when she got on the stand, the, they asked the mom, would you have done anything differently? She said, no. So that wow. did it. That and then the nutty attorney she had, and that's a whole nother story. <laughs> yeah, now talk to us about that attorney because from what I understand, that, that attorney is not an attorney that you want representing you. Kyra, did you see any of the TikToks about her? Shannon Smith. No, is her name. I actually have some more to say about the parenting and how that okay. was viable and how that was nuanced. Okay. But I'm going to get to that after we talk about the attorney. Oh, well, so I will say with the attorney, you guys, if you want a good laugh, go to TikTok and put in <laughs> Shannon Smith attorney. I mean, this lady did a little bit of everything. She like had all her papers um, all stacked up on the, the desk every which away. And the judge said, uh, could you please take care of that leaning tower of Pisa you have going over, the <laughs> over there? She was like, oh, judge, I don't have time to get this organized. I need to go home and have a bottle of wine. She'd say things like that. In the middle of court, she started spraying herself with Bath and Body Works, smelling her underarms. Girl, shut up. I mean, <laughs> no, no, y'all take a look and drop your comments in the chat below. Will you get a free chance? You can't sleep at night at 2 a.m. Google <laughs> Shannon Smith, uh, attorney on TikTok. I also think that this is my personal assessment. I think any parent 
that buys their underage child a gun and then do not provide for a safe environment for that gun to be locked up and stored. Yep. That, that that child could take that gun anywhere and be of any type of harm to anybody deserves this type of sentencing. Go ahead, Attorney Coffee. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. What did you want to share on this parenting? No, sentiment? so I totally get that sentiment. Um, I believe that the Oxford County or um, in Michigan where this was, they're a little gun friendly. And even the gun range where they went and practice was advertised and marketed like a family friendly place. Um, wow. it was arranged, but it was advertised as a family friendly activity. Um, so that just speaks to the culture um, of, of that town. However, what was interesting about this case and what the DA really focused on was what the parents should have known that they did not know and ignore because of their personal, like I think they were going through a separation and yep. where they should have been focused on the child, but were focused on the white, the mother's new boo or her fascination with her horses. When I think like they gave an example of one time, Ethan was having hallucinations and was reaching out to his mother. And she was like, Hey, I'm with my horses and taking pictures of her beautiful horses instead of tending to her child that was going through some type of psychotic break. Um, so speaking to things like that, or there was an instance where Ethan was texting his friend because at that time he was killing and beheading small animals. And he had like a small animal's head in this jar in his room what? and he kept what? under the sheets. And the mom came in the room and the sheets were open and Ethan texts his friend, like, I don't know how she effing didn't see it. It was right there. And he's like, wow, that's crazy. Like, you know, there he's laughing with his friend, how something was right in his mother's face and she didn't pay attention. The father told him to journal about his feelings and knew that he was journaling and had this journal that he expressed himself in. But at no point did they go and look at that, knowing that he was being isolated, that he had a fixation with guns and violent video games, that he didn't really have any friends. The mom said that she knew all his friends. Girl, he only had one. And then that one like ended up going into the hospital or moved away or something. So like, what are you even talking about? And, and I think that is the insult to injury that even when they're right. showing these parents that your lack of parenting caused the untimely death and injury to all these other individuals, you're still not taking any accountability for what you did not do as a parent. So with this manslaughter, manslaughter charge that they were found guilty of, it was primarily because of their negligence and what they should have known and what was ah. in their face that they ignored as parents. So it is making a very um, blatant statement to to states and to courts across the country as well as to right. parents that you can no longer hide behind oh my child did and i had no clue when there were clear signs and indications that you failed as a parent to that child and in your failing parenting you failed other families in the trauma that they have to experience oh so if i hear you correctly for algorithms and anybody else out there that listening that have kids that are unruly we better start opening our eyes to what's going on in their life for two reasons Cases like this sets precedence, right, attorney, red wine and coffee. Yes, and absolutely. other states now can absolutely. lean on these type of sentencing to have you take account accountability for your kids. And for me, I have to say, at least on social media and in the news, a lot of this disruptive behavior is from kids from our black and brown communities. And I want to make sure that from this show, you learn and know that there are the days of you saying, I did not know, or that's just my kid being a kid. I have no control over my kid. It's not passing in the courts anymore. And if I also hear the two of you correctly, this could fall on the negligent supervision. Absolutely. Yes. And remember, yes. this is just a criminal case, but you better believe the families of those victims will also be filing seminal, uh, civil cases to take any assets that that family may have left. Mm, I don't think they have anything left. Mm -hmm. This is some good stuff. You know, the reason why I'm concerned is because when you see all these viral moments on TikTok of the, in, especially in our communities where there's fighting and there's theft and there's everything, usually people just brush it off like, oh, those are just bad kids. This court system, the legal system is starting to make parents accountable. 
And I want all of our listeners spread the word in the community that we don't have the out any longer because once cases like this start being ruled, that means other court cases can use the same court case to reference their ruling. All right, let's keep going. All right, um, algorithms and soulmates, it's that time of the show where we ask for you to participate with us and ask any questions that you may have. And we're going to go to the bailiff. And let's see, we have a few questions. We have a few questions. Kiki Coulter, once again, thank you so much. She says, this show is incredible. Beautiful Black excellence and entertaining with an additional element under an informational umbrella. Impeccable work. So thank you, Red Wine and Coffee, for you guys' excellence, Black excellence. All right, 901 Cash G says, there's one question when purchasing a firearm. That's one question when purchasing a firearm. Have you been diagnosed with a mental illness? Great point. Mm -hmm. So the question and I think here in, is, yeah, go I'm ahead. sorry. No, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead. No, let's say with the Ethan case, that so the questioning about mental illness is definitely a, a, something that is asked. But with Ethan's case, I believe his mother bought it as a Christmas gift for him. So I don't even I don't even know if she would have answered truthfully on her on his behalf or if she would have answered oh, if she right. as if she was purchasing the gun for herself um, and then giving it to her son. And I don't know if he and I could I don't know if he had actually been diagnosed at that time. Um, right. They probably just saw signs, right? But whenever he was, yeah. she yeah. should have snatched that bad boy back and locked it up. Right. That should have been definitely locked up. Now, attorney red wine, you live in the state of Texas. I <laughs> Everybody in the state of Texas carry yes. a gun. <laughs> Everybody in the state of Texas. Uh oh, I don't know what the heck that was. <laughs> that was the eclipse. That was the eclipse. <laughs> Attorney Red Wine, okay, talk to no us about <laughs> talk to us about the firearm laws in the state of Texas because I think that's very important because the state of Texas is is leading the country in in the liberality of gun laws. You know what? Don't get me to lie. I really don't even know what they are. I just know I have one in my car and I have one in my house and that I was you told I don't need a license for those anymore. <laughs> you don't need a license to carry unless you have like certain felonies and different things. So I I, I don't know, but I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> All right. Dimes, Dimes 308 said parental accountability is critical. Some cities are making parents financially accountable for damaged properties and personal injuries to others. Is this good? Well, I think so. When I think of, it makes me think of the case of the, I think it was the six-year-old who brought a gun to school and shot his teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you don't blame the parents, who do you blame? You know? So I think that that, if, if it's not the parent, maybe they're with the grandparent or whatever adult was supposed to be supervising. I think that's very good because prior to that, the alternative rule is that you only hold the parent accountable if the child has done something like that before or if the parent was aware of the naughty behavior. Ah. And I, yeah. And so uh, th that works better when it's a, a good child that just had a bad day. But I think generally the cases that we see in the news with shootings and things like that, those are kids that have a history of problems. Got it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also remember everybody down at the schoolhouse, they document a lot of stuff. So when these cases come through, the first thing the attorney is going to do is go down to the schoolhouse to see if documented behavior, if they have a history of bad behavior to build their case. All right. Last what question. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Attorney coffee. No, one thing I hope is that as these courts are making the parents more responsible and aware of what their children are doing and making them seek help if they cannot adequately discipline them, that there are more programs or things in place to support yeah. parents who maybe don't have the means in and of themselves to discipline their child or get their child under control or even, right. you know, mental therapy and things like that. So I'm just hoping that as the parents are being held accountable, that they do seek resources, but that those resources are actually available for them. I, you know what? I couldn't, I couldn't try, I couldn't agree with that more because we got to understand a lot of our community's houses are single parents. Mm -hmm. And those parents have so much going on. They're trying to raise kids. They're trying to work. They're trying to provide. Some of them work in two and three top, you know, jobs. So you're right. I would rather see them be sent, you know, have more resources to help them with their parents and then just throwing the book at them and sending them to jail. All right, everybody, it's that time of the show where in the court of court of public opinion, we say if the people that we have reviewed are guilty or not guilty in the eyes of court, in the court of public opinion. So first up, 
We have our 70 year old transgender attorney with the enhanced breasts. Okay. Is that attorney guilty of being unprofessional or not guilty? Guilty or unprofessional for being unprofessional or not guilty? Attorney Coffee, what's your vote? Guilty, guilty, guilty. <laughs> no probation, no parole, no nothing. Guilty. <laughs> Put her under the jail and give her a bra. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. And the judge here is going to, in the court of public opinion. Uh, the 70 year old gender uh, transgender attorney is found guilty. Guilty is charged for being unprofessional. Next up, we have Nigel Lithgow, who we have known and know for his, you know, being a, an executive producer of American Idol as well as So You Think You Can Dance. What do you say? He's been charged. Is he guilty or not guilty of gender violence given the information that we shared tonight? Attorney Redwine, what are your thoughts? Look at him. He looked like he did it. Yeah, <laughs> he's guilty, not just based on looks, but based on what I've read so far. I think he did. All right, Attorney Coffey, what are your thoughts? Is I he guilty agree. or not guilty in public opinion? He is, he is guilty, and we need to give throw more on top of it for Paul Abdul that we ignored in the past. That's Ooh. right. I'm going to say in the court of public opinion, yes, we find uh, Nigel Lithgow guilty. Guilty is charged for sexual gender violence. See, that's the thing. He just is very aggressive towards women. All right, Ray J and Prince is the two that we love and admire with that beautiful child that they have together. All right, who are we siding with? Are we with Ray J or are we with Prince's attorney, Redwine? I'm with Princess. He pushed her in the pool. She forgave him. She married him. She gave him the cute kids. They've been going back and forth, and he's a handful. I, I'm with Princess. All right, Attorney Coffee. Who are we with? Are we on the side of Ray J or Princess? Are we making sure that these assets are separated and that they get joint custody? What are your thoughts, Attorney Coffee? Y'all know Ray J all about the money, so he ain't finna um, leave, squeeze um, Princess out of what she's due. No, she gave him gave him children. She's been with him. She's due what's hers under the law if he came in under marital property. So I'm siding with Princess. All right. In the court of public opinion, the judge here is siding with Princess. Princess, we are all agreeing tonight. Yes, if she's entitled to it, Ray J, unfortunately, you got to give it to her. And you said on a national platform that she helped build your network with some of her money. Mm. So this lady is owed, according to you. All right, in the court of public opinion, Tom Brady. Is Tom Brady going to be held liable for lying to the people that trusted him as an ambassador to invest in FTX? Is he guilty or not guilty, uh, Red Wine? I think they're going to find him liable, just like they did the Kardashians. Yes. Guilty, okay. What do you say, Attorney Coffey? He's like, when I'm being a public opinion today, so I'm mixing in some personal biases because I don't think he gives people back the money from Mississippi yet. I don't know. No. I don't think he did. So he's still oh, guilty because he still the some money. <laughs> You're dropping a T right now. All right. In the court of guilty. public opinion, being the judge here, Judge Reynolds finds Tom Brady guilty. Guilty is charged. Yes, Tom. You made a lot of money. You have a lot of money. And look, if according to uh, Attorney Redmond, it's not coming out of your pocket. Pay these people their money back so they get their life back on track. All right, let's go to Danny pa Matterson. Is it Matterson? Someone corrected me in the chat. I thought it was Matterson. I could be wrong. Uh, uh, Danny Matterson from That 70s Show, sentenced to 30 years. I guess there's no deciding if he's guilty or not. But the question is, Attorney Redwine, would you have given him 30 years to life? Yes, yes, they don't never change. Them people to do that stay in there for life, but gone. Bye. All right, attorney Coffee, what do you think? Is 30 years too much? No, not at all. No parole, no opportunity for probation. All right, and I'm going to be the judge of public opinion, Al Reynolds. I'm going to find him guilty. I find it very odd that he is only forcibly raping young girls. That's disgusting to me. That's disgusting to me. That means you're targeting and you know exactly what you're doing. All right, last one up, guilty or not guilty. Would we reduce the sentence for the parents of the Michigan school shooter? It's 10 to 15 years, too many years. Attorney Coffey, what say you? It's very harsh and it sends a loud statement across the country. But yes, I think that they were very reckless in their negligence as parents. So those babies lost their lives. Those people were traumatized and injured and will never be the same. So they got it. Unfortunately, I agree with that with that um, sentencing. All right, okay. Attorney Redwine, what are your thoughts here? Uh, no, they were stupid. They deserved it. Now maybe you can play with the jail horses or cats or whatever they have on her, on her prison camp. Not the cats. 
<laughs> All right, in the court of some public opinion, Judge Reynolds is going to find these parents guilty. Yes, guilty as charged. That level of negligence is beyond ridiculous. And you definitely need, need to take some years to focus on what's important to you in your life. You're raising a mass murderer. Who in the world would not want to take responsibility for that crime right there. All right, algorithms and soulmates, thank you so much for joining the incredible Simone Redwine and attorney Tyra Kyra Coffee tonight as we uncovered many things and taught you many things as it relates to you in your life. Be sure to tune in tomorrow at 6.30 p.m. Pacific and 9.30 p.m. as we continue the Court of Public Opinion. Everyone have a good night.